Professor, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I'd like to invite you to offer some words of welcome before I formally introduce everyone. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, it's great to be here. And this is just yet another uh, a great example of a collaboration between the Merriam Institute and the Fletcher School. We uh, at Fletcher look to prepare leaders with a global perspective. And I'm very excited about uh, talking today about Israel's maritime strategy because it's a very interesting time to think about uh, Israel's maritime strategy, uh, given all of the events in the wider region and the Gulf, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean with the natural gas developments. So we're looking forward to a spirited conversation and uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to, to host you, to have you here at Fletcher. And I'm gonna turn it back to you, Benjamin, to do formal introductions. Ladies no and gentlemen, Thank you very much, and please allow me to express my appreciation to each and every one of you for attending this lecture of opportunity at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Now, every academic year, our organization has the privilege of hosting and presenting to groups of students like you at the Fletcher School. And we're really delighted to return here in order to engage with you because you're an illustrious group of masters and PhD candidates, and we really do value and we really do appreciate your time. It's a real privilege to welcome Rear Admiral Oded Gorlavi. Rear Admiral Oded Gorlavi of the Israel Defense Forces, now retired, is a publishing expert at the Miriam Institute. He's also a research fellow at the Haifa Research Center for Maritime Policy and Strategy, HMS. He concluded his military career in 2015 as the head of the IDF's legal and strategic policy team as part of the planning directorate. He is the former head of the C Division in charge of naval operations, training and doctrine for the Israeli Navy, and his former commander of the Israeli submarine force. He graduated cum laude in electrical engineering from the Israeli Institute of Technology, the Technion in Haifa, and Rear Admiral Gorlavi received his Master's in Public Administration, MC MPA, from that inferior academic institution down the road from you at the Fletcher School, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He participated in the Wexner Israel Fellowship Program. He recently finished a year as visiting fellow at MIT Sloan School of Management. Oded is active in several entrepreneurial projects in cyber energy and agriculture, and he's the CEO and co-founder of a startup focused on the energy sector. He'll be interviewed by Cade Spivey, publishing adjunct at the Miriam Institute and alumnus of the ILAP 2019 tour. Cade was born and raised in Indiana and is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy class of 2011. There he received a Bachelor of Science degree in history, focused primarily on the early Cold War. He served seven years in the United States Navy as a gunnery anti-terrorism officer on USS Gonzales, where he deployed to coastal Somalia. He then went back to the sea as the damage control assistant on USS Arleigh Burke, where he completed a deployment to the Arabian Gulf and fired the first shots of Operation Inherent Resolve in 2014. He finished his duty as a counter piracy evaluator at Carrier Strike Group 4, and he is currently a third year student at the Wake Forest University School of Law. Cade, it's over to you, and I invite you and Rear Admiral Gorlavi to draw up the anchor and set sail for what promises to be a fascinating and informative discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. That was uh, quite the introduction. Um, I, I want to also start by saying thank you to our distinguished friends and colleagues at the Miriam Institute and the Fletcher School uh, for organizing and hosting this webinar today, and of course to Rear Admiral Gorlavi for agreeing to participate. Happy to be um, here. If, thank you, sir. Admiral, I'd like to focus today mostly on the document that you published titled A Model and Methodology for Grand Maritime Strategy. Uh, it does an amazing job of laying out a framework uh, for an Israeli maritime strategy that's both comprehensive and tangible to the layperson. And, and at the beginning of that document, uh, your publication takes great care to frame the history of the Jewish people as one that necessitated being or becoming at least a seagoing people. I was wondering if you could 
briefly describe the importance of the sea to what we would call a historical Israel and why you thought it was necessary to include such a robust description of that history within the broader discussion of maritime strategy. Right. Okay. First of all, thank you very much. And I'd also like to, to say thank you for the opportunity to the Miriam Institute, Benjamin, Alan, and uh, uh, Panini, for uh, Rosita, for, for uh, inviting uh, this, and especially to Professor Weitz and Schultz and Alice for organizing and have the opportunity to speak the mid-careers in the Fletcher School uh, of Law and Diplomacy. It should be a great, uh, and it is a great opportunity at this time. Uh, when looking at a strategy uh, at large and a maritime strategy, uh, we uh, first had to ask ourselves, why don't we have a written strategy in Israel? And when you look at uh, the, uh, to understand that, we went back to look at history. And the history of Israel is in a sense uh, connected and disconnected in different times from uh, the sea. And it was important for us and for me in the process of analyzing this to go and try and create a grand strategy that will encompass the understanding of, of that process in uh, previous history of, of Israel. And the historical Israel approach, um, when, when you discuss it, it's an obvious discussion uh, that, you know, Israel needs to have a, a maritime strategy because of its situation and where it's situated in the middle, in between different countries. And, and we tend to call ourselves an island country, but still it's not an obvious discussion in uh, current Israeli society and leadership in, in Israel. When you look, for example, in a comparison, the United Kingdom, obviously, an island nation, a seagoing nation for centuries. Uh, issues related with the sea and ocean is embedded in their culture. But for Israel, it's not the same. And we find that present uh, Israeli decision makers and the society at large are not experts uh, in this issue. So the background, the historical milestones that we uh, wanted to, to present were needed you know, to anchor the need for strategic approach to the sea. And when you look at that history, the main points uh, uh, in the chapter, uh, we highlight the strategic importance uh, of the sea as an asset. A uh, hundred years ago, David Ben-Gurion, our first uh, prime minister, uh, stated the strategic importance of the sea for the state of Israel. It's uh, very important to continue to explain and build agreement and understanding of that importance uh, and unfortunately, I continue to find little sea awareness in Israeli society and leadership uh, these days. And uh, when you go, let's go back a little bit and then uh, return to current times, at King Solomon times, that's biblical times, he used a lot of engagement, a lot of cooperation in the vicinity with the Phoenicians and others in the area in order to create a flourishing country, a flourishing uh, state and a strong economic uh, position of the uh, ancient Israel. Uh, years later, King Herod, uh, who created uh, the port of Caesarea, which is some 15 minutes away from where I'm sitting right now, also had the understanding at that time of the importance of the sea the, for commerce, trade, power of the sea and control creates uh, more stability for the country and for the welfare of the country. And so the same thing uh, many, many years later, uh, David Ben-Gurion uh, saw that importance and also was important for him to say that the beach, which is a place for recreation, the beach is not the frontier of Israel. It's not the end of the land of Israel. The, adjacent sea is of super importance to us. Uh, and another important and interesting point in the War of Independence in 1948, David Ben-Gurion pushed the IDF to conquer the southern place of, of Eilat and to create a southern port to open Israel from the land to the east, south and east uh, through the Red Sea. That was a strategic move. And that shows the strategic thinking. 
but unfortunately still th these are not written strategies these are actions that have been taken that you can analyze the strategy of israel during those ages and in general terms i think it's it's very very important to have that when you don't have it embedded in your culture the historical look gives you more background and more uh, presence uh, before you actually go about and say okay this is my suggestion for israel maritime strategy and when your document looks at maritime strategy generally, it tends to be very broad scoped. Um, in contrast to when a layperson speaks of maritime strategy, it's almost exclusively within the domain of maritime warfare, um, not so much in terms of commerce or politics. Um, but in your proposal, um, you note that uh, a maritime strategy is much more than just having a navy. Uh, and I want to ask you specifically what you mean by that, um, because while it's a fairly straightforward statement, uh, I think one would be wise to maybe assume that there's more than meets the eye there. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's true. Most people do think of of strategy in terms of military and the use of power rather than in more general terms. And and the reason is obviously the origin of the word strategy from Greek language and later on Byzantine era. It related always to the use of power and army. And through the uh, centuries, it was evolving, but still it's mainly uh, about the use of power. But in recent years, there's a change of what we consider power. It's not only, uh, obviously, military uh, hard power. There's soft power and there's other ways of looking at, at power that you project. And in our days, we think of strategy in a larger picture of national security and the national goals. Uh, in, in, in Hebrew, there's a funny problem as well. And I needed that uh, to, to explain that in, in the Hebrew document, because in Hebrew, there's only one word that is actually used for uh, a Navy, maritime, ocean, et cetera, et cetera. It's the word sea, yam in Hebrew. And even for the lakes in Israel, when you look at the map, uh, Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, it's actually lakes. So in our culture uh, and in the language, you see that uh, there's no uh, nuanced understanding of the subject of the ocean, sea, and the difference between maritime and navy. And when you want to emphasize that, even in the Hebrew language, for decision makers, it was important to say, it's very important to uh, look at it on a larger scale. Sea and oceans include commerce, environment, energy, marine life, archaeology, fishing, sports, yachting, etc. Whatever you conclude. And also defense and naval issues. But it's not exclusively uh, connected to defense. Uh, when you look at the U.S., when you read the U.S. cooperative strategy for the 21st century sea power, that's the strategic maritime strategy document of, of the US. You, you can see that it is focused on defense on a global scale, as you would expect from a superpower, but refers to it as the big enabler of the rest of the things that we just uh, talked about regarding national interest and goals. Or when you read the EU's uh, blue growth strategy, it is all about the other things and very little about defense since that is left for national level uh, of each country and the eu is also benefits from the us obviously and nato for for that uh, for the issues of, of defense specifically so it was important to emphasize that we're talking about one part of a grand israeli strategy that has great importance for the welfare of the country society and it's just it's not just to tell the Navy, you know, write a naval strategy and be done with it. No, it has a broader meaning and has to be all taken into account when thinking and implementing a grand maritime strategy. Thank you, sir. And you mentioned the, uh, the U.S. strategy. I want to kind of draw some, some parallels or some, some distinctions between uh, U.S. strategy and Israeli strategy here. Um, U.S. often claims that one of our greatest strengths um, at least in defense, is our friends, that is, our, our allies and our international partners in peacekeeping. And I'm curious, to what extent do you think the Israeli 
grand maritime strategy that you propose. To what extent is that built on partnerships? And to what extent is Israel prepared to execute that national strategy as an independent actor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I, friends and cooperation with allies comes obviously in an engagement approach and has great benefits. You can use less of your own national resources and still achieve your goals and achieve your national interest. It is also true in business and in academic research. In this globalization era, we, we see uh, that more cooperation creates much better progress. Uh, and in this era, including the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously it's an extremely important uh, thing to do to create engagement, use the connection with friends and all that. Uh, NATO is a great example of this, uh, uh, this approach led by the US and Europe. Uh, and it worked for, for decades and is still working well and doing its uh, uh, getting the national interest and the group's interest uh, uh, getting them done. Uh, not without any problems and friction within the, the system, but there is still a, a very important engagement and cooperation there, which is tied together. Another good example is uh, the ability to create effective sanctions uh, on the Iranians in order to stop their pursuit of nuclear weapons. Uh, this was created by a very strong cooperative uh, strategic approach, uh, just uh, the way we, uh, we need in such a situation uh, where you need to, to block someone else uh, from doing it. It couldn't have been done by one specific different uh, country. Israel is a small nation and with uh, limited resources. And in my mind and uh, my thinking, it has to engage uh, with allies across the oceans. Uh, we engage with the, uh, the US, European countries, as well as regional neighbors, uh, Greece, Cyprus, uh, some that were previously enemies, Egypt and Jordan, are now with full engagement with us. Uh, and today, uh, it's a great, uh, you know, we are just after signing of the United Emirates uh, agreement, uh, the peace uh, agreement with uh, the UAE, and uh, Bahrain uh, is connected, and hopefully uh, with others in the region soon. And this is an essential part of Israeli strategy. I would not take, uh, I would not stop there. I think this is a basic uh, need in this globalized world that we engage more. Uh, at the same time, Israel always keeps the ability to defend itself by itself and not to rely on any outside help as, as much as possible. Uh, this means that we uh, will have to use uh, in some uh, times the denial strategy for example, against terror organizations and other enemies that still call for Israel's destruction. This hasn't stopped, unfortunately. Uh, and when you, you even on the uh, bench or uh, on the speaker uh, place of the United Nations, people say that uh, Iranian representatives and others declare what they want uh, of Israel. So this is something that Israel will always have to keep as a self-ability. Uh, uh, I think it's clear from my, our past and from uh, my own biography, I think that we have, uh, we have to do this. Uh, and I would also add that this is deeply embedded in our social fabric and DNA of the, the Jewish state and uh, also the political views of, of our society. And I also believe that Israel at the same time must always keep a stretched out arm for peace and pursue for peace with all our neighbors. And eventually I think we'll get there. Uh, time will tell, but this combination of uh, serious engagement in the region and eventually using a strong arm against those who are trying to uh, harm the regional stability, that's something that will uh, continue for a long time. And since you brought up UAE, I want to I want to ask you to just uh, kind of look into the future a little bit. Um, given the the outreach recently by uh, Arab nations and and Israel to normalize ties with one another, do you do you see that that link between Israel and the 
Arab world, creating um, a, a situation where uh, Israel's Navy might become more of an expeditionary force? I think this, the size of the Israeli Navy specifically is not large enough to do all the missions that uh, we want as well as be a full part of expeditionary forces. But I definitely think that we are building the force in a way that will enable us to once in a while combine forces and join uh, other uh, forces in the region or at least do some missions that are connected to mutual goals, definitely. Uh, we've been in engagement and uh, cooperation uh, for a long time on, on inter intelligence issues and, and other regional uh, aspects uh, with other countries in the area, uh, as well as the, the powers uh, around the Europeans and the, the Americans, the US. Um, and I think you, we will see a more, uh, a more uh, connection and uh, a more operational connection uh, with the Israeli Navy uh, moving forward once the force is uh, further built, uh, but it won't be like a full uh, expeditionary uh, Navy. It, we don't need to go very, very far in order to achieve our, our goals. And uh, luckily uh, that's something that we can rely on uh, and, and keep ourselves uh, on the right perspective. And then let's just bring in the scope even a little bit closer to home. Um, recently, it appears that Lebanon is going to be nearing an agreement uh, with Israel regarding their maritime border and associated underwater resources. Um, meanwhile, the entire eastern Mediterranean itself seems to be getting more and more crowded. Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, Lebanon, Israel, all vying for control over um, closely related and connected resources, especially on the ocean floor. Uh, I was wondering if you could highlight some of Israel's key strategic concerns there, um, and maybe if you wanted to couch that discussion in terms of what you referred to as a maritime cluster um, in your strategy document. Um, and, and for the listeners, uh, maritime cluster was defined as a group of geographically adjacent members that share institutions linked to a certain field. Yeah. So re regarding Lebanon, Lebanon is an interesting uh, situation. Lebanon is Lebanon, I would expect that we'll have very little concerns with regard to Israel in the sense that in my mind, we could have had peace a long time ago, but uh, we have outside interveners, I would say, Syria and now Hezbollah and the Iranian proxies. They are controlling a small country for a long time and creating a situation of an in a sense, ungoverned country where terror organization roam and control the streets and the government as well. So they're sitting in government uh, and controlling what's being done and the strategy of that and the policy of, of the country. Uh, I would, would say that it's, I, in my mind, it's not the Lebanese people who are deciding what to do, rather it's the Iranians via their proxies who do decide. Uh, the port explosion in Beirut recently shows, in my mind, how devastating such a situation can be. Uh, and uh, we, we need to, to keep that in mind that Lebanese and the Lebanon-Israeli uh, friction is something that we should come uh, to solve. Uh, and maybe it's an opportunity. The gas fields might be something that can be uh, helpful. Uh, the gas field is what brought all of this maritime strategy discussion in the open in Israel. Because as I was saying, historically, the Israeli society didn't really care much about uh, the ocean, even though you know 98% of commerce uh, and trade goes through the ports. Uh, most of the welfare of this company depends on the trade routes of of the sea and going in and out from the east, west, into Europe and back. Uh, it was so obvious to us maritime people, but was very uh, much not in the focus of decision makers. But suddenly, gas fields were found. And suddenly, there is an economic issue, very strong economic uh, uh, change uh, game changer in the in the region. It creates 
energy independence for Israel and creates the ability to, uh, to do commerce around energy. Uh, and this, this is a big uh, game changer in Israeli politics as well as in the Israeli society understanding. And it opened the opportunity for, for the discussion on a grander strategic uh, look and not to be only focused on gas. Uh, while we speak, uh, not while we speak, but today there was a signing of uh, an agreement uh, of, to make the East Mediterranean uh, Gas Forum, signed by Italy, Greece. It was signed in Cairo. It's Egypt is a partner. Uh, Jordan, uh, Cy uh, I said Cyprus, Greece, Italy, uh, and the French and the uh, U.S. are uh, watching from the side. So we have. Uh, this kind of cooperation around gas that has uh, created some uh, opportunities uh, and uh, I, I think that that's a great uh, possibility on the specifically on lebanon there are now talks with the u.s brokering the process mr keshner from the government the u.s uh, person who's who's in the vicinity going back and forth uh, and hopefully this will enable some kind of an agreed line to resolve the issue of the border the sea border and we uh, did the, there was a, a lot of work done to separate a little bit from the discussions of borders on land which the un already concluded that the line is correct but there is friction around it because hezbollah needs that friction for continued uh, buildup of power and to divide and separate that from the border at sea uh, there is a there are different lines the lebanese drew one line uh, israel uh, drew a, a different line uh, eventually i think there's a discussion open and i think when you look at the UNCLOS, the un convention law of the sea and the definition and interpretation of what the line should be i I'm, I'm not sure whether the israeli line will be the exact line at the end of this discussion but it should come to a decision and if you want to, to further uh, read about this, please go into the website. You know, there's a website of uh, HMS on the Haifa University uh, Research Policy and, and Maritime Strategy uh, Institute there in Haifa. And you, you will see deep analysis of, of what we think uh, can be there. I believe that strategically, that situation in which Lebanon uh, will have a gas field for various reasons is strategically beneficial for Le for Israel as well. It's important for Lebanese uh, economy, for the stability of the region. I think Lebanon in, is in a very uh, bad economic situation. It is not stable and I think in Israel's strategic interest to, uh, is to have Lebanon, first of all, uh, out of the hands of the Iranians and Syrians, stable by itself, but as long as Hezbollah is controlling Lebanon, uh, the pursue, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult. Uh, Regarding the, the regional cluster, what I just said, the, the agreement signed in Cairo, that's kind of a, a maritime cluster focused on energy and gas. This is a, a very important move. It's still very focused. It's not broad enough to have all the maritime issues that we were discussing previously. And I think when having a maritime cluster, internal, national one, or something of uh, engagement between the uh, countries around us, I think it's, in, it's, a, it's an important step forward uh, and still specific, uh, too specific in, in the uh, issue of gas uh, fields, but it has broader ramifications. It has broader meaning strategically and instability uh, uh, of the region. Unfortunately, when you look at who signed it, there are three missing states, regional states. So one is uh, Lebanon, we're talking about it. It's not uh, uh, in the signing that agreement, Syria, uh, in, her, in the situation in Syria. And unfortunately, Turkey is not there as well. So since uh, Erdogan came to power, started seeing Israel differently, more friction with Greece, Cyprus, the, the situation is uh, unstable in that uh, meaning. But it's, a, it's a, a good step of creating a maritime cluster in the region that I think will benefit the stability of the region. It's a very important move. 
and good for Israel as well, obviously. And since we're on the topic of, of resources there within that context, um, there's a section of your paper that you titled an analysis uh, of maritime strategies around the world. Uh, it was a comparative study of different, uh, different strategies from different nations. Um, and several of the states that you surveyed embraced at least tangentially the idea of uh, prioritizing ecology, uh, maritime resource security as part of their maritime strategy. Um, and I'm curious, in what ways do you see the Israeli concept of maritime strategy embracing that notion of maritime ecology, uh, specifically when it concerns uh, climate change or the preservation of maritime resources? I think that uh, today's strategies, any strategy of national security has to uh, combine all the things you, you mentioned, issues of sustainability, environment, ecology uh, are a must in any strategy that we have uh, and we are creating these days. Um, and all nations, when you check and see their, in the last decade, the strategies that they were writing had those issues in them because the understanding is that it's also important on the national security level but also on uh, on the economy and the well-being for future uh, generations etc so you, we cannot throw away our, our children's future with uh, our own self-interest of today and i think it's understood so that's that's an important thing and as globalization increases and i think it will continue to do even though some countries are pulling out and pushing away maybe from engagement, I, I think uh, there, this issue will uh, continue and it's uh, important. I think the U.S. has reduced its engagement and leadership in the last decade in our area, especially, and some other regions of the Mediterranean Sea. And it has to take the lead again uh, for the benefit of all. Uh, on the issue of sustainability and um, climate change, Israel is taking the path for more sustainable energy consumption. Uh, in my house, we make hot water from sun and we rarely use and ra rarely need uh, energy from electricity. Uh, in some days in the winter, we do. This is, uh, there's abundant sun in, in this area. But also there's a change in Israel that the consumption uh, of uh, fossil fuel will go down and there's going to be an increase of about 30 percent going into solar and alternative energy sources and it's going to be a big change in the next decade or so so i think uh, that the important part of this is the exploration of gas fields and the implementation of those gas stations of natural gas instead of uh, fossil fuel burning which is cleaner and obviously and, and it's much better so yes, Israel is going in that path. And I think part of, of the maritime strategy and the grand strategy of Israel at large should uh, uh, and has these kind of thinking. You can see the action. Unfortunately, I do not always see a grand statement saying this is where we're pushing. But at the same time, uh, Israel has limited resources. So we, I, I do not see uh, uh, Israel being able to go on the path of what uh, is called the Great Green Fleet of the US. Uh, it's, it's a big change, uh, but uh, and, and not necessarily something that Israel can go and put resources into to make such a big change. So with the aid of technology, we are increasing you know, simulation, training, and, and the like to reduce economic uh, burden as well as environmental effects. So by using less fuel, for example, so less troops are actually uh, moving in the field and they're more inside making simulations and training uh, in different ways. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think it's gonna be a, a part I'm not sure Israel is going to be a, a great leader in, in all of the, those aspects, but it's a small enough country that can make very big changes in uh, issues like climate change. I was hoping to see Israel, by the way, the first country that has only uh, electric cars and uh, no fuel for uh, transportation. I think it was small enough and the vision was there. Uh, it wasn't successful, unfortunately, but there's still uh, a chance to make that happen. Uh, but it's, it's an important thing. And you, you've mentioned two of these now, um, but I want to give you a chance to talk about uh, 
three primary types of strategies that you identified um, that various states use. Those were denial, engagement, and reform. Um, and focusing on Israel, I want to know what you think Israel, what strategy, which of those strategies is Israel most reliant upon? And how do you see that changing within the next 10 to 20 years, we'll say? Yeah. So Israel has used uh, all three strategies. So denial strategy is use force, deny from the other to get his interest and get your own interest uh, achieved national interest we're talking uh, engagement is as we talked about uh, cooperate with others to achieve common interests and uh, the the other which is reform which is a bigger change is actually to be a, a changer of a different country and create a reform uh, at the end of world war ii we saw two very uh, strong examples of, of Germany being changed very strongly and Japan at the same time. But that's the privilege of the, those who conquered to actually make the reform and the society within that was going through that process actually did reform. Uh, Israel at itself, uh, we play around, or I would say used the different uh, strategies, three, three of those strategies, but mainly uh, due to the uh, amount of resources and the strength of Israel, uh, we try in very many aspects to use engagement and to do uh, and to create uh, cooperations in, in different aspects. So we talked about a few of them uh, just now, but uh, in, in military aspects, there are those things that are out there and for many decades will not be able to elaborate on them, but those are engagement definitely. And there are other issues of uh, regional engagement with uh, agreements with Cyprus and uh, right now the, the signing of this East Mediterranean uh, gas forum is an excellent example again of, of such kind of engagement on the maritime domain. There are other uh, kinds of, of engagements of that kind. Uh, but again, if something like Hamas in the Gaza Strip then threatens to shoot on an Israeli gas uh, uh, station, a gas uh, structure there just in front of uh, the Gaza, a little further away into the sea, we will need to deny it from them. And we will definitely need to use uh, force uh, to uh, make sure they don't succeed. And therefore, and looking forward, a decade on this aspect is not too long, but it is uh, uh, long enough to say, I do not see this big change in the next decade in the sense that Israel will uh, stop using its force in order to uh, protect itself. But as I said before, and I, I truly believe that we need to continue to pursue more engagement, further stability through that engagement in the different aspects of, of uh, the maritime arena uh, and with our neighbors. We have the opportunity in the Red Sea with uh, peace with Jordan, peace with Egypt, and the ability to do good stuff there. Uh, all in all, okay relations uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and now with the UAE and Bahrain. I think there is uh, more stability in the region and more options for cooperation, but we will have to use hard uh, power force to, uh, and to deter and uh, to make sure that uh, we are not being attacked in, in different aspects uh, at the maritime uh, arena and to keep our trade uh, routes open. I, as I said, 98% of our trade goes through the sea. We have to keep it. It's economically uh, important, strategically important, and therefore uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, Israel will still be using those kind of strategies. Thank you. And then just, just to wrap up before we, we head into our question and answer session, um, because, because I know at the Fletcher School, both by reputation and by, fr by friends that have uh, attended or are attending, um, we're surrounded in this webinar by past, present, future leaders in the fields, law, policy, national security. Uh, 
what advice do you have for these leaders going forward in their careers, um, especially within those fields? Um, and please feel free to be as general or specific as you like. Okay, okay, it's a, it's a great opportunity and f thank you for that. Uh, talking to future generation leaders, a short story. Many years ago, um, it's the quietest, quietest day in Israel. It's called Yom Kippur, the day of reflection on sins and uh, reflection of what has gone through uh, the year. I'm six years old. And at our village, at the hill, uh, there is a synagogue. And uh, we go uh, at the top of the hill. I go with my parents. My father is inside the synagogue. We're not religious, but what do you do in that day? There are no cars, nothing is on the streets, everything is quiet, no one is going to, to work. This is truly a very different day in Israel. It's extremely quiet and a reflective opportunity for each person in their own way of doing. And I'm at that hill and suddenly I see a military jeep passing. Strange. A few minutes later, another military jeep passing and then sirens and then everybody comes out of the synagogue nobody is staying to pray everybody is going and i hear some of the older parents saying to their kids we're going to the shelter and we're going home and i we went uh, home uh, to our house in the village and uh, we didn't go to the shelter and we were sitting my my father and i were sitting in the uh, porch outside looking at the sky and I asked my father, why aren't we going to the shelter? I mean, it's dangerous. It's war, right? The sirens are going when there is war. And I'm talking now in 1973. And he says, you see the jet fighters right above, the F-4s? They're going to the border. They're going to, uh, to fight, and we will succeed. And I was holding his hand and lying there, feeling safe and secure. Several years later, I'm actually in the States, in Boston, a teenager looking at the vast change in technology uh, first apple computer comes out z80 i still have in my parents uh, place uh, the atari 600 uh, or 800 uh, personal computer that uh, we used old stuff i know and uh, the first shuttle flies out and i see carl sagan in omni and thinking about space technology physics and i understand that's what i want to do this is where I'm headed. Jump forward several years later. I'm in uh, drinking with the commanding officer of my submarine. I'm drinking a strong espresso. And he's saying that in several years, there's going to be a lack of officers that can qualify to become submarine commanding officers. And they need me to stay. And I have to stay because I can qualify and I need to be there uh, to help and to become a commanding officer and there's a change and i eventually i decide to stay and it combined technology stuff submarine is a very technological machine but with people and with the understanding that now it's my turn to create that safe and secure feeling of uh, the, another six-year-old and it connected and I stayed. Many years later, the end of Operation Protective Edge, I'm supposed to retire. And I actually give over the job to the new Admiral that uh, uh, took the job from me. And uh, we said goodbye. And that weekend, I'm the next day actually, I'm running in the fields near our house and I get a phone call. It's the Chief of the Navy and he's saying, listen, uh, the general, the chief of the general staff of the IDF, uh, who's Benny Kanz at the time, and uh, General uh, uh, Nimrod Schaefer, who was the head of the planning directorate, and want to talk to you. They need you to return. They need you to stay and run this uh, strategic task force that is created. It's a new thing. They don't know exactly where it's going to lead, but they want you to lead it. I go back home. I tell my wife, listen, my wife and kids, we're not going to Thailand we had plans we're not going to have a vacation at the time we're delaying it 
I'm returning to do something else. And another, another point uh, of decision making. So I think that those things filled my, my life in, in a lot of good feeling that I'm doing the right stuff. And um, the dots connected in my life in that sense. So I would say, you know, to all, to all of, of you guys, uh, unfortunately, I cannot see you, but I'm sure you're out there uh, uh, watching now, uh, leaders of, of the future. I mean, find something big that you think needs fixing. It can be locally, nationally, internationally. And while working on that, you will have great energy every morning uh, to tackle that challenge and uh, make it better, better. Even a little eventually will make uh, the world a better place. There's a nice uh, song in Hebrew says, you and me, we will change the world. I know people said it before, but you and me, we will change the world. And it's a, it's a beautiful way of saying it. Uh, and I think it's up to every individual to do their best uh, to make things better, but it's up to leaders uh, to show the way and, and lead by example. Leadership is about taking action and not about making statements. So eventually, this is what I think I would like to, to end with. Be leaders, you're on your path, you already are. Some of you already led quite a few things in your life. And uh, I think uh, it's a great uh, thing to do. Uh, take action. Well, thank you very, very much, Admiral, for your time. Um, thank you to the Fletcher School, Miriam, um, er everyone involved. I think everyone can say this was a, this was a great conversation. I'm going to kick it back over to Benjamin for uh, the question and answer. But thank you again, Admiral. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for great questions.